Welcome. Uh, this video is a second part of a lesson on project scheduling. Uh, so in, in this part, uh, we will uh, continue with our discussion on how to develop a project schedule. We covered already the discussion on how to define the work activities and how to estimate the durations uh, of these activities. And this part will discuss how to develop the sequence between these activities and how to represent the schedule as a network of these activities using bar charts and uh, activity or not. Uh, so sequencing is very important. It's actually the spirit of the schedule is how you will sequence and how you will put these activities in line with each other. Uh, we're not discussing actually yet the times of each one when it will be done, but it's the logic behind the schedule. It's like the uh, if you think about it, it's a, it's a program. You do a program or a computer program. Uh, the, the, the way that the code is written is exactly in construction. is how you sequence these uh, work uh, packages and activities in your uh, project. So here, uh, Sherlock Holmes, of course, it's not a real uh, character here, but uh, I like the quote here. Uh, that he described that it's easy for people to follow the train of thought if they follow it from the beginning to the end. Uh, but in, uh, and when you develop a schedule, you don't have the beginning and you don't know how things will run. Uh, so you know the result. The end result is having the building and you have these drawings and mini drawings of what is entailed or uh, to describe a successful project. Uh, so, but he said that it's really challenging for people to have that backward reasoning. I'm not saying backward here as a negative, but it's the way of reasoning. When you have these set of plans, uh, generally for planning and specifically for scheduling, you backtrack and kind of rewind your way of visual representation of the building, rewind and see how things will be put before that point and then moving from the what point before it, what work will be need to be done and like that. So that's a skill that will be, you will get by practice. So it's not the purpose here of the video is not to, you know, at the end of it, you will not actually be able to do it right away. It's by practice. You have to look at a project and start trying it yourself, putting a schedule together and then see how it will actually be uh, done. So this, uh, Reasoning backward is, is the key to develop uh, the sequence uh, in a project. And the sequence here is the logic. So you have to answer a question and backtracking here while every time you backtrack, you answer the same question for the activity you, you reach up to uh, that point. So when you analyze an activity from your activities list from the WBS, you ask your question, what activities precede this activity? So you have to think about what things this activity depends on. And when you answer this question, you have to think about four types of dependencies. First thing is physical and, and technological. So beams need to have columns in place first. So physical, like I need to have this activity done related to this element before I construct that element that I'm focusing on. So uh, columns need the floor to be done first and you keep back tracking until you reach the foundation. Uh, another thing is resources. So there are things that you think initially that can be done in parallel. So if I have two buildings that are built on deep foundation on piles, uh, you, you think that there are two separate buildings, so there is no much connection between them. But if you start planning and scheduling, you realize that I only have one uh, drilling rig or auger to construct the piles. So I cannot work due to resource reasons. I cannot work on both activities in parallel. So I will enforce the logic that I will do the foundation of the first building first and then do the foundation of the second building, even though there is no physical or technological relation between the two buildings. Uh, the, the third type of dependency is safety. So uh, you have to pay attention to the spatial uh, configuration of your activities and the safety uh, impact between them. And also that falls under kind of uh, uh, like if you're installing the structural steel, 
I cannot have any activity done around it. So if you think about connecting utility lines and sewer lines, and I, if you are doing the structures see in the building, forget about that during this time around the building. So you cannot do it because for safety reasons, you have to clear the area where you uh, do rigging and crane operations. Uh, surrounding environment is the fourth type of dependency. Uh, so you have to consider it's more like not a dependency more than a constraint. So maybe you will have to represent uh, the availability, like if you're constructing uh, a bridge, uh, a, a, the, the idea of having a low tide will help you in constructing some of the work. So thinking about the environment around you, the weather, uh, and the, your dependency on doing one activity on these surrounding environment conditions. While doing the sequencing, and while you build that kind of logic uh, and network of logic between the activities, you have to be careful about creating endless loops. So if I say activity A, activity B, activity C, uh, if I say B depends on A, and then after that I'll say C depends on B, and then at some point I made a mistake and said A depends on C, so kind of you have an endless loop of logic uh, and that will cause you, uh, like if you use a software for scheduling, that will be a clear error. It will give you a warning. You cannot do that. So probably one of these links, of course, it's not logical to have an endless loop of work because the work will not be done. It will stay just like that forever. So you, the, the one of these links is actually a mistake. You have to fix it. Now, when you decide on the sequencing and the logic between activities, there are different ways of representing that logic. So there is different type of relations between activities. There is finish to start, start to start, finish to finish, and start to finish. Um, so finish to start means that I have to finish the predecessor before working on the successor. Start to start is I, I once I start the predecessor, I can actually start the successor. So the dependency here is between not the whole duration of activity, I have to finish the whole activity to be able to start on the next one, but I have to start an activity to be able to start the next one. Uh, so that's that's kind of dependency. Uh, finish to start is I to finish one activity, I have to finish the predecessor, but there is no relation between the start and the start, if there is, this is the case. And then start to finish is I have to start an activity to be able to finish another one. So generally, most activities or most schedules are using finish to start. It's a simpler way to represent logic, uh, maybe a little conservative than having the start to start or finish to finish. So it's the most common one, and this is what we're going to use and describe uh, in this lesson and represent our logic with. But start to start and finish to finish is also one common way of representing logic, especially if you are trying to squeeze your schedule. So Finish to start, start kind of, it's a serial way of doing activities. Do this first, once you finish it, do this second. Uh, start to start and finish to finish will give you a very interesting combination of logic. So let's say I'm doing a uh, footing and I'm uh, constructing it so I have to do for first the formwork and then I need to put the rebar reinforcement in and then I have to pour the concrete. If you look at the formwork and rebar, uh, visualize with me here, if you have multiple footings, I do the formwork, which is a box, and I move to the second footing, I move to the third footing, so while you're looking at the side, you'll see many boxes empty of formwork, and you start thinking, why I can't put the rebar, right? Why do I have to finish all the formwork or all footings before I can be able to put the rebar in and install the rebar in? So the start to start will give you that possibility of once I do start the formwork, and I can actually start on placing the rebar inside. Uh, and that's the, that's the idea here, is you can start overlapping things. So it doesn't have to be finish to start. Finish this activity, then second activity will come after, once you finish completely the first. Uh, start to start and finish to finish will give you that uh, overlapping logic. Um, usually another thing is, so we'll focus on finish to start, but if, if you think about start to start and finish to finish, one thing, if you want to do them correctly, is you will need to define for their relationship lags. So every relationship, you can actually define a value called a lag. So if you go back to the formwork or rebar example, if I start the formwork, technically I cannot start right away the rebar, right? I need to leave some time before the start of the formwork. So I will have maybe a couple of uh, footings 
uh, done formwork for and they will be able already to put the rebar in so i need to have some buffer some lag between uh, events in my schedule um, so lags here are very uh, handy when you deal with time uh, limitations on sequencing activities uh, so another example if once you pour the concrete and place it there's always the requirements on leaving the formwork in place until it gains initial strength and then you remove the formwork uh, every building element will have a different lag requirements for concrete so columns will be much shorter uh, lag for curing uh, versus uh, if you think about beams and slabs um, but if this lag if this time buffer needs a resource so let's say this curing is not like you just leave it to cure uh, you actually need someone to go up there and start spraying water or you start applying a coat to reserve, uh, preserve the, the moisture and the concrete to it, so it, it accelerates the, the curing. This is a resource. This is a commitment from you. It's not like an idle time or buffer time between things and you're doing nothing. You're actually committing resources here. And in this case, buffer is not the right choice to represent the logic. You actually need to have a whole activity for curing. So pour the concrete, and then removing the formwork in between, you will have cure the concrete. If this is the case, if you're actually investing resources and committing resources, labor and material and equipment to actually help the cure of the concrete in this case. But if it is just some, one of your daily workers will be going and spraying water, it's not a big commitment. Again, you can go back and not use the whole activity for curing, just represent it as a lag. So, Relationships can be represented in different types. We'll focus on just the finish to start moving on, but all these start to start, finish to finish, and start to, uh, a start to finish uh, are available for you to represent complicated logic in case you want to make your schedule more efficient and squeeze it more. Uh, so after sequencing and after putting all these relations between activities, you should uh, analyze your sequence and logic. So first of all, it will help you to detect any infinite loops. So that will help you before actually using the software for scheduling. The other thing, it will help you to understand more the project, uh, the logic in, into the schedule, and verify that it's actually correct. So once you're do done with the sequencing, you have to look at the activities, and you should see, see three groups of them. The first one is finishing activities, and those will have no successors. And this means that these will be the last things I will do on site. So uh, if I have a building, probably the last thing it will be uh, painting, carpeting. So these are the typical ones. From experience now, when you're done with the logic, you know what to expect to have at the end of the schedule. And also you expect to, to see what activities will be at the beginning of the schedule. So what we call starting activities. And these starting activities, when you look at the logic, you will see that they have no predecessors. So nothing they depend on. So if I have a project, the first thing that I can start is cleaning the project, right? So you can say, oh, I have to clean the project, I have to have the project site available, but, but that's that's guaranteed for to have a project, you have a project site. So cleaning the site have no successors. So that's just a starting activity. And when you look at your schedule and you know, you, I expect to have a, a clean site activity in the beginning and I don't see it, then probably I misplaced some relation and had a predecessor for it. So that's a, a check for you to do. Anything that's not finishing activity or a starting activity, it has now to be an intermediate activity, somewhere in the middle. So it has to have at least one successor and one predecessor. Uh, so in this way, you will not, you will not uh, uh, you know, have any break or missing link in your schedule, and you will have continuous path in your schedule from start to end. Um, and then once you have the activities list from WBS and you have the durations and you have the logic between the activities, now you can start constructing your schedule. You can uh, build a network of these activities using the logic between them. And there are three main ways of representing a schedule or there are some people call schedule types. So bar chart, activity on arrow, activity on node. Activity on Arrow is pretty old, very traditional in terms of they used it to learn how to program computers to do schedules. Uh, so we're not covering that, we're covering bar chart 
uh, an activity or not. So bar charts, or what we call Gantt charts, are a very graphical way of representing a schedule. And why it's very graphical? Because every activity is a bar. The location of the activity will tell you when it will start and when it will end. The length of the bar will tell you how long this activity is, the duration of it. So it's very graphical. And the way you put it or you develop the bar chart is this is the timeline and this is, you, you list all the activities you have and then you start now kind of drawing every activity by bars and the location of it will depend on the logic and the duration of the activities before it. Uh, so let's illustrate that with this example. So uh, typically I use simple examples. I don't say like clear site, uh, excavate, uh, formwork. It's too long and we don't have much time for that, of course. Uh, so I represent activities by A, B, C, D, and uh, I represent the logic by the immediately preceding activities. So IPA, IPA stands for immediately preceding activities. So I'm not listing all preceding activities. I'm listing just the ones before that every activity that I have. So if activity C depends on A and B, and D depends on C, so I don't write D depends on C and A and B because it's kind of implied. If D depends on C and C depends on A and B, then I, I know that I have to finish A and B and then C and then D I will be able to work on it. So immediately preceding activities is kind of a way to just focus on what's really uh, preceding that activity that I'm considering. And then, of course, the durations here. So bar chart, your first one the thing you do, list the activities and then the timeline you have. How long this timeline should be? Uh, in the beginning, you don't know. Uh, you have to run the schedule and put the bars in one by one and see where, where you end up with. Um, maybe a conservative way, you just add up all these durations, kind of very conservative way, and kind of put your grid and timeline and see where your project will end. Uh, but if I start, I will start with my starting activities the ones who have no predecessors. So A and B, my starting activities, have no dependencies before them. So I will start them right away at time zero. And I will add duration for each. So five days for A and three days for B. So starting at time zero means the end of day zero and the beginning of day one. Right, so this point of time. Time five means the end of day five, the beginning of day six. So A, Starts at day start beginning of day one and ends at the end of day five. Now, if I move to activity C, it depends on A and B, both of them. So I have to start when both of the at the time when both of them are done. The earliest of that is starting end of day five. So the end of day five is where I can start C. I cannot start at the end of day three because A is not done yet. So C. And then I can see now D depends on C, so I start D, and also E depends on C, so they start at the same point of time. And then G depends on both D and E, similar to A and B predecessors of C. Now I have G depend on D and E, so the latest time here, or the earliest time I can start G, is the latest finish of both D and E. So, uh, but I forgot F here, so F before, so I've drawn F, but G is dependent on D and E, so now G will be uh, drawn here. So you can see what are my finishing activities. If I look at the activities here, every one of them is mentioned as a predecessor to another one except for F and G, right? I don't see F and G as predecessors for anyone before uh, any other activity here. So F and G are kind of my finishing activities. So that's the that's bar chart, grand chart. It's very simple. Um, bars, length, duration, location of the bar, start and finish times, and that's it. You will find it always in the walls of you know, office trailers on the side. People, once they walk, they can, oh, I, with, with a look, a minute, I can understand what's going on, where am I, what activities will be on this day. So it's very, very simple. The, the main thing about or negative here is that the relationships. By looking at the bar chart, I cannot really comprehend the relationships. Uh, I can represent arrows between the bars, which the softwares provide you with that, 
but still it will be very hectic to follow now all these arrows flowing you know moving between the bars it's not that easy to track but bar charts or gantt charts are still very important tool to represent schedules activity in nord is another way to overcome the limitations of bar charts but they have also kind of the, their own limitations but both of them are used actually in industry to represent the schedule so you represent your schedule as a bar chart for specific purposes and activity in node for another for other purposes um, so activity on node some software uh, uh, or industry kind of uh, call it pert p-e-r-t pert which is not the correct way to call it. As an academic, this is not correct. So just to fix that. But the industry used to call it PERT. So, so PERT, this is how people call it. But activity or not from its name, is every activity is a node. And then the logic between them, arrows represent the dependencies. Very simple, right? Uh, but they're missing here the time scale. So they don't have here, you don't represent time scale here. Uh, so let's see the same activity, uh, the same project. Uh, a and B are starting activities, so I will draw them as node. C depend on A and B, and then D depends on C, and also E depends on uh, C. And then finally here, F depends on D, and G depends on both D and E. Again, it's also very simple. You don't have to worry about scale. You just keep drawing nodes and connecting uh, between them with arrows. Uh, one thing I need to pay you, uh, get your attention to is um, starting and finishing activities so the point the best practice for drawing activity in node is you start with one node and end with one node so what happens if i have multiple starting activities you put in purpose one node i will call it start and i will branch from it to my starting activities so kind of it helps to wrap uh, the logic of the schedule at the beginning and i will also do the same at the end so I have one point to start the project, one point to end, to end the project. Helps later when we cover critical path method and we'll make sure that you're not missing numbers uh, here and, and there at the beginning and the, be and the end of the project. So that's a best practice. You don't have to do it, but I highly recommend that you have a starting node and end node um, uh, in your project. There's one thing here I will fix. This actually should be end. Um, so uh, going, now you have start and end and now just to clarify these again these are the starting activities they have no predecessors and f and g here are your finishing activities they are not predecessors to other activities so we, we're done with this these two steps we learn how to sequence the projects uh, in general the concepts and the factors you consider when you do uh, sequencing and then the next step was to represent the schedule as a network using bar charts or activity or not. The last step in the process of developing schedules is actually calculating the times of activities and assessing the criticality of your schedule, which we'll see in the last uh, video of this lesson. Thank you and take care.